Thank you, Kate. And thank you so much to the uh, WASP organizers for inviting me to speak today about the AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report. So as Kate said, my name is Teresa Lanowitz, and I'm head of cybersecurity evangelism with AT&T Cybersecurity. Part of my job at AT&T as head evangelist, I get to write this awesome report every single year, and I get to work on it with my awesome, awesome team every single year. So we're going to dive into some of the details on this report. But before we get started with that, as I said, thank you to the OWASP organizers for inviting me to speak. This is my favorite conference of the year, absolute favorite, hands down, because it's two days, two full days of application security, not a track, two full days of application security, which is yet the biggest problem we have to solve in security. Prior to joining AT&T Cybersecurity, I was an industry analyst. And when I was at Gartner back in 2002, I wrote a research report that said, application security, why is it taking so long? 2002, 2023, 21 years in between, not a whole lot has changed. And this group is going to make it happen. So this, as I said, this is my favorite conference because where else can you ride a mechanical bull, talk about app security for two full days, and get to learn how to pick locks? Best conference ever. Best conference ever. So let's dive, jump right into what we know about the AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report and what we found. So we've been doing this research for nearly a decade. We started in 2015, and this is our 12th edition of the report. If you stop by our booth out in the hall, we have hard, hard copies, printed copies of the report. You can also download it. I'll give you a link to download at the end. But we've been doing this since 2015, so you can see all the covers there. I took it over in 2019 when I joined AT&T Cybersecurity, and since that time, we've been talking about this concept of edge computing, the next generation of computing, and what that really means. So today, we'll take a look at what we mean by edge computing. Some of the big key findings from this AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report and how you can really prepare your organization for that next generation of computing. So this report, it is vendor neutral and forward looking and actionable. Those are three things that are really important. Vendor neutral, the only place you see the word AT&T is on the cover. It's forward looking. This is about the opportunities that we have ahead of us. And, and actionable, it tells you how to solve some of those problems that you might run into or how to actually have that conversation in your organization about how you can move forward. So how, how did we do this? We went off and we did a field survey of 1,418 of our closest friends around the world. North America, Latin America, EMEA, which includes UK, Ireland, France, and Germany, and also APAC, which includes Australia, Singapore, South Korea, and India. So we have a big global sampling, and we said we wanted to talk to people who were director level and above in security, in IT, in application development, and with the line of business. And the line of business is critical because they're the ones that are really making these decisions about what is happening next. What's happening next in terms of delivering better business outcomes through the use of technology? And oh, by the way, security is part of that business requirement now. So global survey, we also inform this with qualitative analysis coming from industry experts in the area of cybersecurity. And we surveyed seven different verticals. Healthcare, retail, finance, US SLED, state, local, and higher education, energy and utilities, transportation, and retail. And you see I have, this is the big report up here. And we also have these vertical reports for each of those seven verticals that we surveyed. Here today, we have SLED, healthcare, manufacturing, and retail. And we'll have our transportation one coming out November 29th. And we'll have our financial services one coming out January 24th. And we'll end up with our um, energy and utilities one on February 28th of 2024. So that's all the seven verticals. And then this is just a double click on that data and breaking it down for that industry vertical. So that's just a little bit about the report, a little bit about the methodology, who we surveyed. And of course, we want to thank our contributing vendors that we work with. 
So Akamai, Cisco, Avante, Sentinel One, Checkpoint, Palo Alto Networks, and VMware. They are really, really great partners with us on this report and provide a lot of the qualitative analysis. So edge computing, the title of the report is the edge ecosystem. You've heard me say the word edge a couple of times, but what does edge really mean? And typically, if you ask 10 different people what their definition of edge computing is, you'll probably get 12 different answers. And it will probably lean to the tech stack that someone is either selling or someone is either working with. But if we think of edge, we're really poised on the precipice of a new generation of computing. It's a new generation of computing that is underpinned by networks with lower latency and higher bandwidth. The applications are different. They're no longer these GUI types of applications that are expecting some type of input from a keyboard. So our applications are changing, our networks are changing, and the users of that edge computing use case, they're expecting a digital first experience. And so for the purposes of this discussion and for the report, we said, well, let's define edge with three characteristics, three common characteristics that make up edge computing. The first is it's software defined. That can be on-prem or in the cloud. The second characteristic is that the applications, the workload, the hosting, it's closer to where that data is being generated and consumed because edge is all about real time, near real time, and data. And the third primary characteristic is that it's a distributed model of management, intelligence, and networks. And you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, all right, I heard that, give me an example. So here's an example that we see in our everyday lives, and we've probably all seen this one. Imagine driving into a big parking structure at an airport or in a downtown area. You drive in, there's a big digital scoreboard, and it says, here you are on the first floor, wouldn't you like to park here, but there are two available parking spaces. And you say, you know what? I'm not going to take my chances to try to find one of those two available parking spaces because maybe it's between two big trucks and I could barely fit. Maybe it's not satisfactory for me. So you go to the second floor and there's a digital scoreboard that says 50 spots available. And you say, great, this is where I'll park for the day. You drive in, you find one of those 50 available parking spots and that big digital scoreboard for the next person says there are 49 available parking spots. Now think about this use case for a second. You didn't have to open up an app and say, I'm going to park at the parking structure on the corner of Maple and Third. You just went. You were served up information in near real time. As a car leaves a parking spot, the number on the scoreboard increments. As a car goes into the parking spot, the number on the scoreboard decrements. That's an example of an edge computing use case that we see in our day-to-day -day lives. Near real time, you didn't have to open up an app. The data is being processed right there at the edge. It's not being backhauled anywhere. It's being presented to you right there in near real time. So think about edge computing. Think about that use case. And we'll talk about other use cases in the course of this presentation. So when we did the survey, the survey, the field survey of 1,418 people for the AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report, we wanted to know where the survey participants were with respect to implementing yet edge use cases. 57% of them said that they were either in a proof of concept mode, partial implementation of the edge computing use case, or full implementation of the edge computing use case. So that's a pretty good number. And what we wanted to find out was, what are they finding? What are the problems with the edge computing use cases? What are the top edge computing use cases? And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. We also wanted to find out what their top endpoints were. Because as we said, edge computing is, it's the, the workloads, the applications, the hosting. It's closer to where that data is being generated and consumed at some endpoint. Our apps are changing, they're applets, they're ephemeral, they come together on an as-needed basis. They're not something that we're using through a GUI sort of interface. So 48% of our survey participants said, 
Our top endpoints for our edge computing use cases are the usual suspects. Phones, tablets, desktops, laptops, those typical types of endpoints that we all have today. But what we also found out is that 30% of our survey participants said, you know what? We're using really diverse and new and emerging types of endpoints. And some of them are intentional endpoints that are purpose built for our edge computing use cases. Those are things such as robots, manufacturing, their top endpoint, robots. Wearables, wearables, healthcare. Healthcare said we're using a lot of wearables for the use case of at home medical care. Somebody has a surgical procedure, goes home, the doctor, the nurses, they want to be able to monitor the vitals of that patient. And they don't want them to use something like our regular smart watches. They want them to use something that is intentional and purpose built for that particular use case. They want to make it easy for them to be able to change the battery. They want to make it easy for them to be able to report the information. So robots, wearables, autonomous drones, autonomous vehicles. One of the things we found from our healthcare survey participants is they said, you know what? We're using robots in the hospital or in the doctor's office to help us clean an exam room. So after a patient leaves the hospital or after a patient leaves the exam room, a robot goes in and disinfects the room, disinfects the exam table. Far more efficient than a human being going in and doing it. But that robot has to be secure. Also think about healthcare. Every single device in your doctor's office, in the operating room that is connected to the, end, to the internet, those are endpoints. And they told us all about how they want to secure and how they need to secure those endpoints. And we go into it in a whole lot more detail in our healthcare report. So those new and emerging types of endpoints, the endpoints that you might not be thinking about today, they are coming online very, very quickly. So you may be saying, you know, my endpoints today, it's laptops, desktops, phones, tablets, our usual suspects. Be aware that those endpoints, they're diversifying very quickly and they're coming to market very, very quickly. What we also found out is that the edge ecosystem it's non-circuitous, it's non-linear. It's far more difficult to secure than something that was living in a pure castle and moat type of environment. The more democratized computing becomes, the more risk we have, the more we have to worry about securing it. So think back to the mainframe days. The very first virus was called the Creeper virus, written by Bob Thompson in 1971. It wasn't malicious in any way, shape, or form. What it was intended to do was show that code could move from computer to computer. As soon as we opened up the doors of those data centers and said, here we are now in the departments with our PCs connected through PC LAN networks, the risk started to come in. The cyber adversary started to come in. We moved from PCs being in our departments to web applications, cloud applications, mobile applications. And here we are now poised on the precipice of this new generation of computing, edge computing. Everything is different with edge. Securing it is different. The way we think about it is different. The way information is given and received is different. So with that as a prelude, let's dig in to the top findings of the 2023 AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report. So what we found out is that as computing, is on the precipice of a new generation. The way we think about cybersecurity is changing as well. So our cybersecurity thought process, the way we think about securing things, that's changing too because we have different types of endpoints. We have different types of applets. We have different types of environments that we have to secure in. We have to focus on the use case and what's going on there. So we're seeing that there's new types of thinking going on Inside of, the, inside of the enterprise right now for edge computing. And the first thing we saw was that the top aha moment for us in this data was the concept of balanced investing. People always want to know, how much money are people spending on security? How much money are people spending on the network? How much money are people spending on applications? We have that all broken down. The second big aha was this concept of cross-functional communication and collaboration. 
And we've been saying this for probably the last two decades at least, that we need to break down those silos that exist inside of our IT organizations. We need to work cross-functionally. Our speaker this morning talked about working cross-functionally. Uh, I said in a session on mergers and acquisitions, they were talking about working cross-functionally. So this is a trend, this is a theme. We have to break out of our silos and we have to work with others inside the organization. And as the keynote speaker said this morning, we have to be able to speak the language of business as well. And then the third thing we found is that dynamic cyber resilience is very real. Making sure that you're future proofing, making sure that if your business suffers some unforeseen incident, whether it is man-made or natural, you can continue running your business as usual. And this is a key component for architecting edge computing use cases. So I mentioned that proactive and balanced investing is something that we're seeing. Organizations are taking a look at this concept of edge computing and they're saying, you know what? Security is no longer this isolated thing, this group of really smart people who sit over here and look at logs. Security is now a business requirement. It is something that every business needs to be thinking of. It's something every business needs to be looking at. And what they also told us is that we realize that the outcomes that we're going to get from this are really going to drastically shape our business. So we're looking at this new technology as a way to really deliver better business outcomes, whether it's in a B2B environment or a B2C environment. But we're looking at edge computing as a way to deliver better business outcomes and we have to make sure we're investing properly for it. And so when we look at the top use cases across the board, this slide shows us the top use cases from 2022 and 2023 in the seven different verticals that we surveyed. So you can see that these use cases are evolving and changing. We don't have any one market segment that has the same use case in 2022 that we have in 2023. So what that tells us is edge computing is working. These, peop these businesses are finding value in what they're doing with edge computing. In 2022, our top two edge computing use cases was in manufacturing with video-based quality inspection and also in retail with loss prevention. Those were our top two use cases in 2022. So think about video quality inspection. It's my favorite use case of all these use cases up here. You're assembling something on an assembly line and you have a series of cameras and sensors watching what's, going, what's happening on the assembly line, on this automated assembly line. The moment some defect is encountered, the moment some defect is identified, maybe the production says variance can be between X and Y and your variance goes off. The moment that variance deviates from what is allowed, the entire assembly line shuts down. Now, Think about that. From a technology perspective, that's pretty cool, right? You're kind of like, wow, we programmed that, it's really cool. But from a business perspective, what that's saying is that, all right, we don't have to have as many recalls on our products. We're not putting defective products out to market. We have a really good quality control methodology that says that our customers are going to be far more satisfied. So that's impacting the business outcome. Now, Let's look at 2023 and the top use cases for 2023. So healthcare, we see teleemergency medical services. So an emergency medical technician in the field comes upon somebody who needs help or somebody who has phoned for help. Maybe it's a bicyclist who fell and they just need some stitches in their knee. We have all been there. I've been there many times. So instead of taking you, bicyclist, with just you know some stitches in your knee to a trauma unit, they can take a look at this near real-time information and say, right, we can take you to this other place where we're not going to tie up the queue for people who need really maybe life-saving um, medical attention. So teleemergency medical services. Manufacturing, smart warehousing. And as I mentioned, the top endpoint that manufacturing organizations are concerned about are robots. So manufacturers told us that they are using a series of smart robots on the floor to help them move goods from one place to another. They're really looking at that robot to be able to be very efficient. 
And you think about their last use case, which was video quality inspection. And those two suddenly start to tie together. Retail, real-time inventory management, understanding what they have, where they have it, and when they're going to actually use it. So really dovetailing quite nicely into the supply chain for retail. And then we look at energy and utilities, intelligent grid management. We see so much on, on, on the news and in TV shows and documentaries about why the grid needs to be managed. And so the, uh, the energy and utilities organizations, they're looking at this idea of intelligent grid management using edge computing, making sure they have near real-time information about what's going on with that grid. And then finance, real-time fraud protection. This is something in financial services. Last year, they told us they were really moving pretty, pretty hard to real-time fraud protection with their edge computing use cases. And then transportation fleet tracking. They want to know where their asset is, their truck, their plane, their rail car, their ship. They want to know exactly where it is because they want to know exactly what's being carried. What did the retailer give them to carry? What did the manufacturer give them to carry? So you suddenly start seeing some of these use cases really come together quite nicely. And that near real-time information can be shared among all the stakeholders in that supply chain. And then the top use case for 2023 was US SLED, state, local, and higher education. Smart building management. The ability to do preemptive maintenance in a building so that you're not disrupting the occupants during the day. The ability to be able to understand when something is going to break so you can bring a repair person in before it actually breaks. And just a side note on this one, on the intelligent building management. Back in 1999, I worked for Sun Microsystems. I worked on a project called the Genie Project, J-I-N-I. And it was this exact idea of smart building management and preemptive maintenance. So back in 1999, we wrote the use case for this. The Genie Project said, yeah, you could be able to do this. And here we are now in 2023, and we're seeing this use case come to fruition. So this is pretty exciting for me. So these are the top use cases that we found between 2022 and 2023. Remember, 57% of our survey participants said, yes, we are either in proof of concept, partial implementation, or full-scale implementation. So we're moving pretty quickly with these use cases. So now, getting back to how organizations are investing for edge computing. We said, of your total edge budget, how much of that edge budget are you planning to use for security, for applications, for the network, and for strategy and planning? And what you can see here, this is a survey, N is 1,418. So of their entire edge budget, they're allocating, on average, 22% for security, 22% for applications, which is really great, 30% for the network, and 23% for planning. Now, I look at this and I say, my background is security and application development. The fact that security and application development are on this bar graph at all is really, really great. That means we're moving forward, we're making progress. But what it also shows is it's pretty much on par with network and with strategy and planning. So this says that security and applications, organizations are not saying, yeah, let the developers over there do whatever they want, throw it over the wall when they're done, we'll move forward. Or let that security team, when something happens, then we'll bring them in. So this is saying we're looking at things far more holistically. And the other thing we learned is that Organizations said, you know what, we're investing holistically, but we also need to collaborate. We need that cross-functional communication and collaboration. Over the past four or five plus decades, inside of IT, we've seen silos build up. And we all know it. We have an application development silo, an operations silo, a security silo. And we typically don't talk to other people. Maybe it's because they're just in different geographies, different regions. Or we say, you know what, we're really busy. We don't have time to talk to those operations people. Um, so what they're saying is that this idea of internal collaboration and communication is really critical and essential. 
But what they also told us is edge computing is something new. It's something very, very different. And we need to think about bringing in a third party trusted advisor. So from a data perspective, what we learned is that 71% of organizations told us that once they go to production with some computing, edge computing use case, they bring in that third party trusted advisor. And this number varies greatly between the different verticals that we surveyed. On the US SLED side, state, local, and higher education, this number rises to about 85%. On the manufacturing side, the number dips to about 65%. So these numbers vary greatly between the different verticals that we surveyed, but on average, it's 71%. And what this is saying is, you can't do it alone. You have to find help from somebody else, somebody who has done this before, whether it be a global systems integrator, a cybersecurity consulting organization, a managed security services organization, a telco to help guide you with the network. So they're looking for that third party trusted advisor to be able to come in and advise you. Because people were saying, you know, we're spending a, a quite a bit of money on this. We're making sure that we're communicating and collaborating internally. And we have all these pieces to the puzzle. And we're really focused on delivering better business outcomes. It's not just about how cool can we be. It's about delivering the business outcome. And what we also found out is this edge ecosystem. Organization said, we are really future proofing. We're building for the next generation of computing. And we want to make sure that we're building out cyber resilience. And what we found is that 41% of the organizations that we survey say that operational technology functions are really leading the way for edge computing. So think about IoT use cases, industrial IoT use cases, and operational technology use cases. And what we have here, and this is just a more detailed look at the data, we see all of the different OT functions that people are implementing with edge computing use cases. So you see that it's the more industrial types of organizations. So manufacturing, transportation, energy and utilities that are really forging ahead with this idea of edge computing. We also found that there seems to be some type of legacy thinking going on prior to moving full scale to edge. And we asked our survey participants, of these cybersecurity controls, which ones do you think are important to deploy or which ones are not important to deploy? So we see up at the top, firewall. Everybody says, yeah, firewall at the network edge is really important. But if we pop down to the bottom, you see that they're saying that patching, vulnerability management, DDoS, they're saying it's not very important. And you look at this and you have to scratch your head and say, if we think about industrial IoT, IoT types of thing, devices being out there for our edge computing use cases, the idea of patching, the idea of making sure that we're prepared from a DDoS perspective should really be right up there. So we look at this and we're like, this is kind of legacy thinking where people are thinking, I'll just implement maybe the one or two cybersecurity controls that I need in my organization. And again, I meant this is just a little bit of a blown up portion of that table where you see that patching, they're saying not worth deploying at all. Think about where some of those critical vulnerabilities live. Think about what we've seen now where um, we're being told that you cannot deploy an IoT type of device unless you change the default password. These IoT devices are now patchable. So this idea of patching and moving away from manual patching, but moving to automation. And this morning we talked a lot about automation in these sessions. So this idea of automation is critical when it comes to patching. And then DDoS. People said, DDoS is really not worth deploying. And again, you have to really look at that one and scratch your head and say, why in the world would somebody say DDoS is not worth deploying? And this was a low number for us in 2022 as well. And in 2022, we said, well, maybe people were thinking about DDoS 
And they're saying, well, it's kind of passive. If it's there, if I need it, it's there, and thank goodness I have it. But again, it came in very low this year. So this next slide I'm going to share shows this transition in thinking from legacy thinking here to more forward thinking with edge computing. This is a heat map. And if you get a hard copy of the report, it's on page 30 of the report. And it's my favorite piece of data for 2023. So the way we read this is we asked our survey participants on a scale of one to five, one being the lowest, five being the highest, how concerned are you about any of these attack types? And we listed the attack types. DDoS, business email compromise, personal information exfiltration, phishing, insider threat, account takeover, nation state cyber attacks, and ransomware attacks. And on the x-axis, we have the seven different verticals that we surveyed and the total. So across the top, the gray bar, that's the total. That's all 1,418. And then we have the seven different industry verticals that we surveyed. Finance, healthcare, retail, manufacturing, energy and utilities, transportation, and US state, local, and higher education. So if we take a look at this, if we take a look at the gray bar, the number one attack type that our survey participants are concerned about is DDoS. They told us DDoS was the thing they were most concerned about, yet we go back to this previous table, and they're saying, DDoS isn't really worth deploying. And so this is where we're saying, as we interpret the data, we say, on one hand, they're telling us DDoS isn't that important to deploy, but on the other hand, they're saying, DDoS is the thing I'm most worried about. And if you look at the types of attacks that we've seen this year, DDoS is right up there. So in terms of that thinking, that thinking is moving from a legacy way of thinking to a more edge way of thinking. One of the other bits of data that we uncovered is that um, our survey participants told us the more edge computing use cases that they have, the more cybersecurity controls they bring in. So if they just had one edge computing use case, their cybersecurity controls weren't that great. Once they got to four or more edge computing use cases, they brought in more cybersecurity controls. So if you take a look at this table, this is a really great table to take back to your organization, figure out which vertical you belong in, and look at your own organization and ask yourselves the question, are we concerned about these things? And if you take a look here, not everybody has DDoS as their top concern. If you look at finance, for example, their top concern is business email compromise. If you take a look at transportation, their top concern is account takeover. So the, account, the, the attack types are fairly appropriate for the different vertical markets. But across the board, they're telling us DDoS is our number one attack concern. And if you think about what's going on with Edge, Edge says, our attack surface is expanding. Complexity is increasing. We're outside the four walls of our organization. We have IoT devices. We have OT devices. We have IIoT devices. We have medical IoT devices. Our attack surface is expanding. If an adversary can come in, take down one of my medical devices, take down one of my cameras or sensors or valves on my manufacturing floor for some period of time, get into my network, move laterally. DDoS is a pretty easy way for an adversary to go, especially if you're saying, I'm not going to worry too much about patching or changing my password. So that's why we say that there has been, in the previous table, legacy way of thinking, and now this is a more edge appropriate way of thinking, looking at DDoS as a number one attack concern. And people say, I can't believe that DDoS is number one and ransomware is number eight. And we were quite perplexed when this data came back as well because we all thought ransomware, because ransomware was number one in 2022, DDoS was number eight. They completely flipped positions. But if you subscribe to the theory that there are more IoT types of devices out there that you can get past DDoS defenses with just barrage, the barrage of attack, there are more items to attack, more IoT types of devices to attack. The attack surface is expanding. This makes perfect sense. So, you know, and 
One of my colleagues always says, well, yes, DDoS is number one, ransomware is number eight, but this whole table is still blue. There's nothing up there that any vertical market is saying, we don't have to worry about it. So these attacks are still very much out there. They're still very much alive. So I'd suggest taking this report, taking this table back to your organization, figuring out you know, where you fit on here. What are you concerned about? Have the conversation about where this leads you. So what we're seeing then is that edge is the complete inverse of what we have seen with more legacy types of environments. DDoS is more likely, ransomware is less likely. Think about what ransomware does. Ransomware says it requires some activity on the part of a user to click on something, to download something. Think about what DDoS does. DDoS can go in, it can take down some type of IoT device and start to just generate that attack for 15 minutes, 25 minutes, 45 minutes, but give that adversary enough time to be able to come into your network, potentially move laterally, and be able to start then dropping malware. So they work very well in tandem together. And we've seen that in multiple attacks where ransomware and DDoS work quite well together. But it's interesting that we are seeing this new style of thinking where DDoS is top of the, top of the list in terms of attacks. So that's definitely a disruption in the way the attacks are coming about. So what did we learn from all of this data? What are some of the key takeaways? I love this slide because what it shows is all of the seven vertical markets that we surveyed and where they are with respect to at least having one fully implemented use case. And you can see it's being led by US state, local, and higher education. So 66% of our SLED survey participants said that they have at least one fully implemented edge use case. And the primary use case they're looking at is building management. And their top endpoint, mobile devices, and their top concern is personal information exfiltration from an attack perspective. The next up is retail. They're saying real-time inventory management is their top use case. And their top endpoint, personal computers, very specific in personal computers. They were the only ones to say that. You look at the top endpoints from these other industry verticals, mobile devices, industrial robots, fixed location, kiosks from a financial services perspective, personal computers, that's retail. So retail is undergoing a big, big shift right now. And if you think about what retail has in terms of warehousing, how they're looking at um, loss prevention and so on, we'll start to see those endpoints shift from a retail perspective. So again, this is all in the report, it tells us we have, uh, for each vertical that we surveyed, we have a really nice spread showing what the top endpoints are, where they are in terms of implementation, what their top data rate is, and so on. So I'd take a look at the, at the report. And everybody says, well, what should I do? You know, you've offered up some really good information that there's really good balanced investment, that we need to communicate and collaborate with one another more, that we need to make sure that we're building for resilience. So make sure that when you say, we want to go down the path of implementing edge use cases, make sure that you're beginning with the end in mind. Why do you want to do this? And this is where the line of business is going to help you. Why do you want to do this? What are you going to gain from it? What is your outcome going to look like? This is this idea of beginning with the end in mind and communicating and collaborating with the line of business. And then you want to make sure that you're developing an investment strategy where security is equally invested along with applications, along with the network, and along with strategy and planning. And then you want to make sure that you're collaborating internally, that you have all of your stakeholders internally aligned, but you also want to bring in that trusted third-party advisor, cybersecurity consulting, managed security services, global systems integrator, a telco. Really make sure that you have those trusted advisors lined up with you. And then make sure that you're future-proofing. Make sure that you're building for resilience. 
We're seeing the need for resilience more and more on a daily basis as we see more and more attacks. Remember, our attack surface is expanding. Complexity is growing. So remember, cybersecurity is a journey, not a destination. There's always going to be great opportunities for us, and application security is one of those top concerns that we need to be dealing with right now. So if you don't want to take a printed copy of the report with us, please do visit us at cybersecurity.att.com. And also visit our booth. We're right out there in the hall. And I have awesome colleagues here who are working at the booth. Belinda, Justin, Keith, who's speaking tomorrow, um, Christian, Mark, they're all out there working. Mary, all out there working at our booth. So please do stop by and visit us. I, they have the reports. And Justin brought us a lot of other really cool things to give away out there. So thanks very much, everybody. And questions? Uh, thank you, Teresa. We actually have a challenge coin for you and a gift card. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. You are welcome. This is awesome. These challenge coins are so, so cool. I had the opportunity to speak to a, uh, a high school group who, uh, it's a high school in Cincinnati, Ohio. It's called Lakota High School West. And they have a whole cybersecurity program. The students coming out of that program, they come out with they're uh, certified ethical hackers, CISSP. They go and they complete, compete in capture the flag contests against college students and they win. And they, 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 they made their own challenge coin with, uh, with, with a laser printer. So cool. But these are definitely very cool. So thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, that's very good talk. Thank I you. just want, uh, have one question. I want to have a better understanding. Uh, so you said the sled. Uh, the main thing, the application is building management. Can you be a little bit, so maybe I have missed, building management like more for access control or for? Yeah, so building management in terms of edge computing use cases. So making sure that they understand, so for example, preemptive maintenance. Is my HVAC system operational? Is it going to fail on the hottest day of the year? Um, managing the temperatures. So. If it's going to get to 100 degrees Fahrenheit this weekend, when people leave on Friday at 5, do I turn off the air conditioning? So being able to be smart and interact with, with weather apps, those sorts of things. So that's uh, smart building management. Oh, OK. I thought that it's more of like um, access control of all the doors and windows. No, 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 no. And the well, secure I mean, areas, you know, it, you may have different sensitivity in, in the building, right? I yeah, I mean, they could, they could do that, but the way they, what they told us was it was more along the lines of maintenance. Environmental and what control, we also do yeah. is um, we call out the top five use cases for every vertical market that we surveyed. So for SLED, um, looking at uh, virtual, augmented virtual reality for training purposes, um, uh, community safety, that was a big one last year. So those are some of the other use cases, and we go into the use cases in more detail in, this, in the vertical reports. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, so thank you, Teresa. And uh, just a, a PSA: the happy hour starts at five, but sometimes they're ready a couple of minutes early. And speed debate will be in here at uh, five o'clock. You can bring your beverage of choice in with you. And speed debate is my personal favorite thing of LASCON. Uh, it's it's absolutely hilarious. So. If you can stick around for a speed debate. And then after that, we have Roger Thornton with a fireside chat, all during happy hour. That's 6 to 7. Make sense? Ride the bull. Oh, and ride the bull. Yeah, ride the bull. I forgot about the bull. <laughs>